Uh, we're very happy today to welcome uh, Dr. Tanya Bergerwald. Uh, Tanya comes to us from Ohio State, and uh, she's a she's appointed there in three units: computer science, electrical computer engineering, and evolution ecology and organis or organismal biology. And Tanya and I have know, uh, know each other from two places. One is that we meet at uh, data science leadership meetings. And also, um, Ohio State is my alma mater. You, some of you might know that. So, you know, uh, that's, it's good to have that connection. Out of, out of yes. Well, we'll not, we won't go there. Um, so she's at Ohio State. She's the director of uh, Translational Data Analytics Institute. Uh, which is a big organization, and she's recently received significant funding from NSF to set up uh, the uh, Harnessing Data Revolution Institute, uh, and which will study a new field called image genomics. And she's going to talk to us about that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, Tamar, for the kind introduction. Thank you for inviting me and uh, for the opportunity to tell you about this new field of, oops, the new field of science, imageomics. So if nothing else, by the end of this talk, this talk, my goal is that everybody can pronounce it. So let's practice. <laughs> so there's gonna be a quiz halfway through the, this talk. So, you know, pay attention now. So imageomics, let's say it with me. Imageomics. Oh yeah, good, fantastic. Fantastic. You know, like this proteomics, imageomics, same thing. Okay, imageomics. Okay. You know, imagine this well, kind of the, the public radio, the, the corporation like, CB, uh, what is it, the Canada, huh? CBC, thank you. I want to say NPR and then I'm like, uh, CBC voice kind of saying imageomics. There we go. So what is this thing? <clears throat> you know, at the beginning of the 20th century, Henri Paul Poincaré published this wonderful, tiny little book called Science and Method. And it really kind of articulates a lot of what we call today the scientific method in many different disciplines and unites them in many different disciplines. And at the end of it, and by the way, I highly encourage you to read this. At the end of it, he summarizes this and says, the scientific method consists in observation and experiment. If the scientist had an infinity of time at his disposal, yes, it was his at the time, it would be sufficient to say to him, look and look carefully. But since he has no time to look at everything and above all to look carefully, and something I tell my students all the time, since it is better not to look at all than to look carelessly, he is forced to make a selection. This first question then is to know how to make this selection. And it is true for every science, right? And so what I would argue that, you know, we're still, the, the, fundamentally everything that we do has not changed this approach, the scientific method. It really is about choosing what you're going to look at and looking carefully. The only thing that technology and computation did is enable scientists to look more carefully at more things, not to change the questions that they're asking, not, but to expand the range of questions that they can ask, to expand the range of ways that they can go about answering them, but fundament by fundamentally just expanding the range of things that they can look at and enabling them to look more carefully. And scientists have looked, the way we've studied the natural world, the way we've understood nature for centuries is about looking and reporting what we look through increasingly more sophisticated ways. If you don't recognize, there are the Darwin's finches, there's Jane Goodall, you know, so, so it, is, it was all about looking at nature and it deriving insight, insight some notion of intuition from observable patterns, and then, you know, make going to making that creative leap to generating the answer to why 
we see those patterns. And technology increasingly did enable scientists to look more carefully at more things, particularly you know, with the invention of the microscope, we were able to look at down tiny scales that were not accessible to human eyes before. We didn't have the hardware right, to see at that scale. And to start asking and to start asking questions at that scale, the invention of uh, binocular telescope and uh, satellites enabled us to zoom out to the scales of the entire planet. And again, to be able to look at many more things, hopefully more carefully. And then came genomics. That's the one that has the N in its word, right? Imageomics doesn't. So, you know, genomics is the science of understanding biology from sequences, right? from text, using quantitative approaches. And over the history, by the way, did you know that the human genome that kind of started the new uh, era and what we call genomics was, when do you think it was actually sequenced? Like, let's go for decades. Which decade was it sequenced? And if you actually know the answer to this question, uh, this is just about guessing. Yeah, go ahead. 2003, any other guesses? Two thousand eighteen. Any other? Actually, just last year. Finally, <laughs> was finally yes sequence, and that I'm actually, and this is I think the third article that says yes, we finally sequenced the human genome. So I'm expecting another one in a couple of years. Yes, now we finally sequenced the human genome. So yeah, it took a while, right? We we, we were a little bit more patient then, maybe, but when we established new field of science. So, so, but with the thing with, the, with genomics, what also happened is that this, the fundamental question of biology, connecting phenotype, the things that, the collection of biological traits, and we'll talk a little bit about them, what they are, to genotype, the collection of uh, what is extractable, the patterns and, and the functions of genes that are extractable from the genome, your sequence, the functional sequence of genome, uh, of your genome. That connection became for the first time explicit, explicit. And not only that, but we really focused, we kind of forgot to look a little bit at the natural world and really focused on extracting phenotype to genotype. But really that connection you know, when we looked at genome-wide association studies and, and, and uh, the variations in the genome and connected them to, to phenotypes of diseases of associations with one of the first ones was uh, the two genes that are associated with increased risks of breast cancer, BRCA1, BRCA2, BRC1, BRC2. Uh, but there's many, many other ones that were extracted. The comparative genomic studies across species gave insight into the varying phenotypes uh, and evolution and how phenotypes evolved in the first place. And then recently we even started changing the phenotype by changing the genotypes through CRISPR, right? We started really playing this game in the direction of let's change the genome, let's change the genes, cut them out, change a little bit, to change, you know, that so to break the association with diseases, to change uh, the the maybe potentially harmful, to take out the potentially harmful mutations. Uh, here be dragons, but uh, but the thing is, we got away quite a bit from this notion that we can observe, look at a lot of things, look carefully at a lot of things out in the world and extract phenotype, extract useful insights into the phenotype. But in the last few years, we're actually starting to get the technology to help us look at a scale never before possible. But that's true every time, right? Every time we invent technology, it changes the scale. It changes the, our ability to look at more things. So the satellites, the autonomous vehicles on the, uh, underwater, on the ground and in the air, 
on body sensors, uh, everything from GPS collars and uh, heartbeat monitors and voice recorders. Uh, we have our baboons outfitted better than some uh, explorers go out. Uh, and, you know, there are in situ sensors such as uh, motion trigger cameras, camera traps, and acoustic sensors. And then there is all these devices of all the millions of people who go out and take pictures or report something and post it on various social media and other platforms. There are, there are many, many, many ways now to get a lot more data to be able for scientists to be able to look at a lot more things. And by far, the thing, the type of data that is most recorded, that is, mo that is most abundant, are images. There are millions and millions of images. Okay, let's see. How many of you have taken a picture of a living organism in the last week? <laughs> All right. How about in the last day? A living organism. Yes, humans are living organisms. <laughs> We're just one of the species, <laughs> one of the many, many species out there. Right? So, so how about a picture of a living organism, non-human? Plants, plants are counted, and your dogs and cats are counted too. Yeah. So, so you see, there's still what I mean. Even when we narrow down, there's tons of pictures of all the various living organisms. Here's another quiz. And this is my public service um, for, for, the for the conservation community. How many species of living organisms, not counting bacteria, so uh, plants, animals, fungi, how many species are total estimated are out there, do you think? Again, both parts. Yeah. Three million. Three million, okay. Other? So all the animals, including insects, including uh, plants, including fungi, yeah. 25 million. 25 million. Any other? Huh? Under sea, yes. Everything, not counting, just not counting bacteria. Like everything, everything. Like think of all the insects, think of all the spiders and bugs and uh, all, the, all the mushrooms out there and all the plants and all the animals. What do you think? Yeah. Huh? 10 million, oh, right. billion. billion, 10 billion, okay. So the estimated number is about 9 million, which is a shockingly low number, especially when you see these reports that UN has put, been putting up, out now every couple of years, now every year, that about 1 million species are threatened with extinction, which means more than 10% of the entire world's biodiversity is threatened with extinction. Nine, millions is, nine million is a shockingly low number, right? So that was a digression. So, but yes, we have tons and tons of pictures of all of these living organisms. Just to give you a sense how many, just one platform, which is a citizen science platform called iNaturalist, you can, anybody use that? Yeah, okay, a couple of people. So you can snap a picture of a plant, a bug, a, a, a uh, an animal, and you can upload it to this platform and uh, even identify the species right away. They have a pre-trained -pre version that does a good job, or you can submit it for, for expert identification. But this one platform has more than 130 million images of more than uh, 40, 400,000 species. So, so a good chunk of the world's biodiversity up there, right? About uh, plus minus five percent, not bad. And uh, but what do you notice in this? Let me look. Right? Yeah. So where it is from? And the thing is that where it's from. So so these regions is where we have the highest concentration, and it's covered a little bit. But the highest biodiversity of the world is actually here, and Australia. So there is, we're not seeing the biodiversity of the world through this lens. So we, we're looking at more things for sure, but the question is that we're looking more carefully. And then the, and so that's a lot of information. That's clearly not the only source that we need to look at it if you want to see the world's biodiversity and, uh, and, and see the, the species, the, the, to get more data to understand the natural world. 
And to look at this more carefully, we do have technology that has been like rapidly developing in the last few years. We have our ability now off the shelf tools that we can take all these images and we can uh, uh, do detection and localization. So we can detect objects of interest. We can put a bounding box around them. Uh, we can do species classification, all of this, as I said, without like bare, quite often without any retraining or fine tuning needed. Uh, species classification, so we have a gravy zebra and an African buffalo. Uh, we can do even a pose estimation, right? Fitting this uh, uh, stick kind of figure, ways to do a lot of uh, behavior extraction. I'll show an example of what we can do with it. We, we can do environmental reconstruction. We can do individual ID down to individual. And that, by the way, is technology that we developed. So we can take all these millions of images automatically, right? Find all the ones that contain animals, find where the animals are in those pictures, put a bounding box even behind that baby elephant that's hiding behind its mom, um, and identify not only down to species, but individual animal. And that's uh, the, the technology that uh, we not only published a couple of papers, but turns out it was it's super useful for conservation and wildlife management. So we started an, a, a nonprofit called Wild Me and, and, and built this platform called Wild Book. So yeah, you can say not only is the zebra giraffe whale a turtle, but zip is a zebra, Joe the giraffe, Terry the turtle, and wither the whale. So you can do a lot of stuff with this now. You can really maybe, maybe start looking really, really carefully at all of these images. So are we done? That's it, right? So we have, we can look at more things. We can look at them more carefully. Fantastic, done. The, the uh, na uh, understanding the natural world from images solved. And behavior, so things like beak colors, stripe patterns, you know, thin curvature, fused teeth, scarring, uh, 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 size of birth, pollen feeding, uh, the particular way of nest weaving and so on. So it started and, and its traits are determined both by the genes and the environment, as well as the interaction between the two. So the, whether the animal is healthy or not is part of the, could be part of the environment, right? Uh, what causes its uh, potential risk to disease, but whether it's going to get sick or not quite often is its genetic uh, makeup, right? And so it's these interactions. Um, it started all, you may have heard about Mendel and his team. And so all the aspects of it, what he was stu studying is the flower color, the seed shape, the seed color, the, the pod color of, of the peas, pod shape and so on. Those are all traits that together making, making up the phenotype of the peas. Uh, there are traits, this is traits at the population level. They're within one species, right? So you can, there is, there is within the species, intraspecies variation. There is the cross different species. You can have how different birds lay eggs or, or weave nests. There's the, the, the species level behavioral traits such as an opossum playing dead when threatened. Um, there's individual variation of the, of the stripes, uh, uh, the individual traits such as biometrics, the, the pattern of stripes that are unique to each individual, your shape of your ear or the fingerprint or the, you know, all, or the iris, the, your eye. Right? All of these are, are the traits. And so what we were trying to do is we need to make traits computable directly from images. Because right now, if I ask biologists, oh, so how do you decide which traits to study? Like whatever is important to me, whatever is interesting to me, that's pretty much it. And they make no excuses about it. <laughs> There's also a strong bias of, of what is observable by humans, right? What we find interesting and important. So what if, we, what if we're missing a whole bunch? What if we're not seeing something that is, we should really be looking at carefully to understand the why of evolution, the why of adaptation, the why of the interactions between the natural world and the environment around it, the ecology. Yeah. Yes, I'll get there. Yeah. So this means you'll have to stay through the end of the talk. <laughs> so by the way, 
I should have made this disclosure at the beginning of this talk. I will show very, very few actually published results. A lot of it is in the, we just started, so the Institute is a year and a half, the field is a year and a half old. We've defined a few projects, we've done, made some progress. Most of it is kind of watch this space. And this is an example of the kinds of things that we can be doing in this space. So, uh, but some things have been published already and uh, I point them out and everything about individual ID has been pointed out. So yeah, so this is the Institute that was established in a new scientific field to really go from images to biological traits and phenotype, extracting it directly from images, the semantically biologically meaningful aspects of images, both videos and uh, movement. It's a collaboration, the core team across 11 institutions with uh, both biologists and computer scientists. And we're, we're increasingly sort of growing in terms of partnerships and community. And the core idea behind it is that we can start with images in all the different modalities. And there are tons of, tons of ways. So technology, all the technological tools that I mentioned, but there's also, you know, there's 3D texture models. There's the digital x-rays. There's the, the, the fluid contra imaging. There's a whole bunch of, imaging modalities that are relevant to, bio, to biology, then we can take all the other rel related data such as text, uh, uh, textual data from anything, uh, the, the, the field guides and tree of life descriptions, biological descriptions, and just the metadata around the images that people post and, every, and what's known as ta taxonomic keys and everything else, there's the geospatial data, um, and, and, and the molecular data, eDNA and the Bioscan project, for example. And together as input, right? There are a lot of associations in the data already, but biology is also the field, the science of classification in its original sense. It's the science of structured knowledge. It is the first field where taxonomies were started. It's where, you know, we have all kinds of hierarchies. There is the taxonomy, there is the phylogenetic tree, the evolutionary tree, they're all slightly different. There is the uh, taxonomic keys, which allow you to identify uh, birds in the field uh, or uh, as you go. Uh, there is the ontologies, everything from protein functional ontologies to uh, anatomic ontologies. There is tons and tons and tons of even for behavior, they call they have these structures that are called ethograms that define the, the, the kind of relationship between different types of behavior. So all of these structured knowledge and all of these structures, first of all, can be expanded from the input data to knowledge bases, to really rich knowledge bases, but also can be used to guide and to constrain the architecture of the neural networks and the more sort of modern version uh, of, of the foundation models and the, you know, the large language models. So it's not so that you don't, because we don't quite often have enough data to train these large models. So you need to really guide them. You need to really constrain, you need to ground them in a very different way. And the added benefit, not only that you can do more with less data, you can do more interesting things such as, well, if not explainable AI, at least the evidence-based AI, the, these, this is this species because. So let me give you a couple of examples of what kinds of things we can do. The first thing is, well, can we really do the because of this is the species because? Uh, we started with the, Let's do species classification and see if adding any kind of structure to it actually helps. Right? And can we extract the phenotype? Maybe we're missing some traits altogether uh, that, 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 that separate and differentiate between different species. So we started with, uh, just because again, this is the data we have. This is the people that are part of the team. A uh, whole bunch of fish, a family of minnows, about 200 plus species of minnows. Many of them look very, very similar. Oops, Mary, many of them look very, very similar. 
especially to the human, even expert eye. And the, uh, sorry, it's a little darker than, than it should be, but it makes it even more mysterious <laughs> and indistinguishable. So, so if you just run straight up classification on these species, then in and of itself, if you don't, if you have enough data, you could, but if you don't, which is in biology, you never do. Um, this is, these are museum, uh, digitized collections of museum, natu of natural history museum specimens. So they're beautifully photographed with light control and calibration and everything, and you don't have enough images. And the, the other part is, so, so classification doesn't quite work very well in sparse and bad data regime. And the other part is, you know, can we leverage the fact that the species that share taxonomic conce concepts, such as their common gen genus or whatever, so higher hierarchies and species, maybe they have the same features also for the, you know, different neural network layers. All right. So can we bridge the, between the two? And so straight up try, let's do classification without the, the, uh, the taxonomy and let's add the genus, just one layer, just as a proof of concept, genus features. One layer up from one level of hierarchy up from uh, in taxonomy from species and add them for species classification. So not only it actually it improved not only it actually improved the classification accuracy, especially in the sparse data regime, and all data here is long tailed, no matter which problem in biology you're going to touch. So it's not only just looking at more data, you need to look at it more carefully. But it also, when you look at saliency maps of where the, the neural networks are actually you know, firing, which pixels are considered more important, it moved from essentially random to the parts of the fish that are also known to be taxonomically important for species classification. So great, this is a proof of concept. It's actually maybe working. And so we're now moving it further, not only to take one layer of hierarchy, but more and moving from, taxon from taxonomy to phylogeny, where you do have the notion of evolutionary time and seeing and, and, and connecting that directly to the, uh, to kind of what we call the genome to the imageon, extracting the, 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 the commonalities in the image space that correspond to the genome space, the evolutionary genome space. So why would we think that we haven't seen something out there? That the traits, the biological traits that you know, humans may you know, haven't noticed that may be important at all. Well, we have an imperfect, uh, we have an imperfect uh, evil, uh, hardware, the visual hardware. Yeah, it's pretty good, but not, you know, it evolved for very specific purpose, for very specific range, and for under very specific con uh, conditions and selection pressure. So for example, it was shown, uh, there's a paper that came out in December that the uh, humans were not good at differentiating between dif different phenotypes of a polymorphic moth because shockingly, we don't have enough acuity in the red-orange space because it did not evolve. That, that, that signaling, that coloration in the moth did not evolve for human, for human eyes. They couldn't care less whether we could differentiate or not. This is for birds. Those are the ones who are putting selection pressure, the predators, right? And they're the ones who have the color acuity in the red or orange spectrum. But the machine learning classification approaches, like pretty straightforward ones, had no problem at all separating between the. So yes, we think that machine learning approaches, computational approaches can help us look more carefully and maybe find traits that we completely missed because we could not see. We don't have the right hardware. So uh, we looked at, you know, from moths to butterflies. So we looked at a classic example 
uh, in biology of mimicry. This is like when they talk about mimicry, this is the system that biologists have been studying for many, many years. So these are all butterflies. All of them, them are butterflies from the uh, family of Heliconius butterflies. And there are two species here, believe it or not, only two. There is the Heliconius errato. So all of these are the same species. Also. And there is the Heliconius notomini. And you, that all of these are the same other species. And you probably notice that these pairs, they look more similar to each other than they do to, to the other ones in their own species. That's because habitat by habitat, region by region, mostly these guys are mimicking this way, these ones, but sometimes it's the other way around. Why? Because these ones, they evolve first, and they evolve to be unpalatable to birds who are their predators. And these guys, and through selection pressure, right? Because the birds ate the ones who, who were otherwise. So, so, so somehow this signaling to birds, it's not that these particular parts of the, of the butterfly taste bad. It just turns out that this is what the birds learned that this, the ones that have this pattern do not taste well. Do not taste great. And so these ones come around and I'm like, okay, great. <laughs> you know, we can take advantage if we look like these ones. Right? So they could get there a lot faster with half the genome, in fact. And they're looking like these guys. So great. There is the pressure to look to look similar, as similar as possible, to gain the advantage uh, not to be eaten by the birds. And, and that is, you know, for the birds, they just need to be looking similar enough for the birds, but they have to look different enough so their own species mate with the right ones. Otherwise, you know, this is a pretty serious, a serious problem if you mate with the wrong species, because you're not gonna have any offspring. Uh, so the first question we asked is, is there a signal at all? Could you actually find the mimic pairs do they, can you find an embedding in the, in the, uh, in the latent space when you do just species classification that kind of picks up the signal that, yeah, the mimics are more similar to each other than every other pair of, uh, of the two species? And the answer is yes. So, uh, and I can tell you tons of details depending on what do you call similar or different? You will still find an embedding where the distance in the embedding space between two butterflies of the same species, this is Arado and this is Malpomene, versus the distance between two butterflies of different species that are not co mimic, and versus the distance between the mimic pairs, right? It's right in between there. So, all this says, and there's various variations of this, all it says is, yes, there is a signal that machine learning picks up. But does it matter biologically? Do, does it matter, you know, do birds, if we did this, the same kind of thing through bird's eye machine learning, would, they put the co-mimics much closer to the, to the same ones. And the difference between, you know, co-mimic pairs and, 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 and self would be a lot closer. And if you do this through butterflies' eyes, would they be able to better separate between, you know, the ones of their own species versus everything else and push the co-mimic pairs much further out? And the answer is, let's try it. Oh, wow, that doesn't come through very well through the <laughs> projector. All right, so uh, the, this is the, the human acuity. So you can actually now get these models for different uh, species vision. The, you can even do the spectral shift and everything. We went, we, the first step is just the acuity. 
not there is no spectral shift here, which we will do. We'll go to UV and everything else. But this is again, can we do this? So this is the bird acuity for the right species, the ones that are predators for this. This is the, the human ones. That's the original machine learning on this. This is the butterfly acuity. It's not just blurring, by the way. There is a little bit more going on because the field of vision, what can what they can sort of how they accumulate this and, and all of this. So so this is the butterfly acuity for the model specifically for, for heliconius. And don't ask me how they actually study. There's a whole branch of so what we expect is that birds, yeah, they can they can recognize. They occasionally can recognize that this is the co-mimic, right? So if we train the model on just on, let's say, errato, and ask it to, to recognize the, the mimic, birds will occasionally be able to recognize that it's a different species than, than, than the mimic, the co-mimic, but they won't do it as well as butterflies. And butterflies should really be able to separate anything of the other species from self. And that's exactly what happened. Drum roll, please. All right. So this is the bird acuity versus butterfly acuity. This is, we're asking the difference. So this is not the accuracy. The accuracy is, is a little bit, uh, you know, we can go into that direction. But this is the difference on recognizing each one of them, on asking to recognize self, trained on, let's say it's trained on errato and to be able to classify errato versus to classify co mimic of errato. And it's putting co mimics closer to self. This is for errato, this is for Mulpomene. So this is the difference between co mimics and self. And this is for the butterflies. And the butterfly, that difference, it's pushing the co mimics a lot further out. So, yes, it does. There is the signal. Now the question is, what is the signal, right? So we know now that it actually, the biology in the embedding is coming through. We're using probably a good enough machine learning model that is constrained by biology quite a bit. Good enough that in the embedding phase, we can pick up the right biological signals. So great. So in this space, then we can start asking, what is that signal? What is actually making them similar and different? Where is that similarity and difference? And so we're using swing transformers. Uh, this is to transform. So this is the generative AI. This is not, uh, we're taking this, you know, the co-mimic pair of Arata and Malpomene and transforming one into the other, not just pixel by pixel difference. Not, it's not the morphing. It's not the image morphing. It's the generative AI. So what you do is you have the embedding space and you take a walk in the embedding space from one to another, from a Malpom from Arado. This one is Arado to Malpomene, this is Malpomene to Arado. And at some point along that path, you generate images that correspond to the points in that embedding space. And this is what's going on there. So you would expect there is that you wouldn't expect actually that there should be anything that is preserved at all in the image when you generate these images. It could be random, right? You could have these random spots appearing here and disappearing. There is nothing that tells you that it has to be a smooth transition at all in the image space. And yet it amazingly is. So by the way, you'll notice that it's pretty subtle shrinking of these white spots, well, yellow pale yellow then there is this uh, you know a little bit of uh, morphing on here but the biggest thing is is in this region and what they will tell you every guidebook how to differentiate between these two comimic pairs it's the connected versus disconnected what they call nail heads right so this is disconnecting and then they grow here to connect essentially to the body and so, yeah, we can start now kind of outlining. And so what we're doing now where this is going and in a published yet part is the, in a systematic way to do image registration, which matches the biologic semantic points that are called landmarks, biological landmarks, uh, and to quantify sort of the difference around the landmarks because we know the genome, we actually know the genotype that, and, and the genes that are responsible for orange, for, for orange, for red, for yellow. So you can start quantifying the color around the biologically meaningful point and the change 
in the color. And then you can go back to the genome wide association study and say, okay, so what, what's going on there? So that's where this is going. Cool, eh? Yeah. <laughs> I have a, I'm curious, so how much of the biology expertise were needed a in, lot. <laughs> in training these models? Uh, well, in training the models, not a lot. I mean, we, we had the photographs. We worked with biologists. They're the one who, who, who get through this process of IDIC bio. But then turns out if you just take the photographs, oh, the data set that the, the one, there was a paper that was published. It turns out it contained a lot of misclassification, contained a lot of hybrids, which you shouldn't be using. And then we, we had did it and, and kind of showed a study. We have a poster and one of yeah, on CVPR that showed also the, the differences between if you use hybrids versus not. And it's hybrid information is orthogonal to mimicry uh, in many ways. So, so you do need quite, <laughs> we have weekly meetings, yeah, of the whole team, yeah. Uh, but the taxonomic key, so how do you do image registration, uh, is, is really biologically meaningful image registration. That is straight up biology. You need biologists to actually label those, yeah. So, yeah, good question. It's always, and it's a lot more fun to work in an interdisciplinary team than uh, I used to say, you know, a long time ago that, you know, when biologists say, you got to see your data. I'm like, my data looks beautiful in a CSV file on my screen. Like I can write scripts that will understand my data. They're like, no, 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 no. You got to see your data. I can't believe it took them three years to get me out to Kenya after we started working together. So, um, and on that spot. So remember that thing that we built a whole nonprofit that can identify individual animals from photographs. So in, in fact, we can do it for many, many, many species in the water and on the ground. We can even use the shape of a whale's fluke or the dorsal fin of a dolphin. And when I tell kids that, uh, you know, when I tell kids that, that we can identify individual zebras by the pattern of the stripe, one of the questions, and it always comes from kids, weirdly enough. So our baby zebra stripes similar to its mom. It's a fantastic question. It's a fantastic question because what they're asking are patterns, zebra stripe patterns, heritable. And possibly maybe they use them for, for recognizing who is their baby versus not. Who knows? The thing is, we don't, we can't, we don't have the, the, the middleware for this because we're really, really good at, at quantifying the difference and the similarity between faces. We have the whole evolutionary uh, infrastructure that, that evolved in our brain that is the whole region of the brain that's dedicated to recognizing faces because we, that's how we recognize who is our baby versus not. We say, oh, look, the baby looks like its mom, the baby looks like its dad, not perfect. But you know, <laughs> here's the yeah, here, look at that guy, it looks like that celebrity or whatever. In fact, if you stare long enough on any random pattern, you will start seeing faces. It's we oversee faces, we err on the side of false positive. We see faces, we see faces everywhere. So and we can quantify that similarity somehow. We don't even know. But if I ask you, are these two? more similar to each other than these two? I have no idea. Not only we have no idea, no amount of training we get to, will get you to the point of being able to quantify that similarity. We just don't have the right infrastructure. But computer vision algorithms do the same algorithm that we use to recognize individual animals, not only uh, quantifies the similarity, it also highlights, uh, the regions that it actually matched. So, so it really quantifies the similarity and it's indifferent to lighting and, uh, and uh, quite a bit of rotation and uh, pregnancy and aging. So, so we really can quantify that similarity. And using that, we can now start asking questions about the pattern similarity versus genetic similarity. So we started with a the not a perfect data set, but let's begin. Let's see if we could do this. So, so this is a data set of Indian leopards uh, where they only had mother cub relationships. So no genetics, just the, the, uh, the, the mother cub relationships. And so we asked for every individual, give me the individual, the photographs of individual, uh, sorry, for every photograph of an individual who is the other than self closest individual in the population, right, in the, in the data set that we had. 
And so it turns out for a cub, it's mother. For a mother, it's cub. It was bidirectional. Again, cub, mother. So this is like that, you know, we, we saw this again, the goosebumps. So yeah, there is some aspects. So cats are visual animals, not color, by the way, but yeah. But there are other parts that have been consistent. This above the uh, eye, the, the brow region kind of thing. It's been used in like several of these pairs. The thing is the data set is too small. So we're now actually collecting uh, zebra with genetics, the full population of graduate zebras in Kenya with genetics. And that's really we can, where we can ask the question in a much more direct way. Uh, is there a correlation between the image sim stripe similarity and uh, uh, genetic uh, distance? So we can ask, are these for the first time ever? And this is extracting a, uh, a trait, right? That was not known before, that was not even observable before because we did not have the ability to do this. Um, it, we, we also have a, a project kind of using the same, similar approach that looks at kin recognition uh, in birds for eggs using the pattern. And I'm happy to talk about that. Uh, after the talk, we just don't have enough time for everything. Uh, so on to biological traits. So we've talked about sort of the, the uh, species level traits. We've talked about population level traits, individual traits. Now, and, but all of them were static. So now the, the behavioral traits, somebody asked the question. So, so uh, and behavioral traits are complex. So there's still structures. So this is a collaboration with uh, um, evolutionary anthropologists who study baboons, behavioral ecologists, uh, which started my whole foray into the into to ecology in the first place. You're observing a lot of behavior. There's child care, right? There is the, the chasing, there is the displacement, there is the, the walking, grazing. Uh, a lot of different types of behavior. In fact, biologists have this behavior, this whole chart. I'll let you stare at it for a second. That's the ethogram of behavior just for baboons. And we're looking at the simple ones, they said. The ones that they think of as unit behaviors. I'm like, dang. <laughs> right? How do we do this? So you can start with, uh, so here's the same baboons. And it's actually doable. So you can start, you actually can classify uh, train, you know, basic behavior. And the thing is, there's a lot of mixing. There's can be walking and foraging. Or I'll scoot out so you can see. There is um, displacement and foraging. So one pushes away the other to get to the food, right? There's a lot of this thing. So you can get to complex behaviors to really start. Um, the, but the thing is, uh, what is, what is, this is a stationary camera. So this is a little bit easy. Um, the, there's the foraging and walking. There is, you know, like eating while, while walking. The thing, what it doesn't get yet, that a lot of these behaviors, you only get to the behavior when you kind of get over time, right? There's a signal over time. There's one behavior that also can follow another. So there's very much a dependency component. There is also the thing is that the, a lot of them are like displacement, right? It's in, it, it, it takes two to tango. It, you know, there's then there's the group level behavior. There's a lot of stuff. So to expand this, uh, and as part of this Imageomics Institute, we also uh, have a course that we started. Um, it's a year long course called Experiential Introduction to Imageomics, where it's taught for students, students from this year, we, uh, it's a year uh, from eight universities across the world, uh, two in Europe, three in Europe, sorry, two in Europe, one in Kenya. Uh, and taught by faculty, co-taught by faculty from five. So we give introduction over the fall semester, both to biology and computer science, the relevant parts of the two. And then uh, they work on projects, we take them to Kenya in three weeks. So this is some of the examples of the things they, they were doing in Kenya. There was a project on fish, project on geckos. There is a gecko and understanding the evolution of topads, or geckos and automatically measuring morphology. This was the group team meeting right outside, uh, observing baboons and zebras. And so one of them was really 
can we get behavior and understand not only sort of extract semantically meaningful behavior and understand behavioral traits from drone images in the wild? Because in the wild, you need to be able, you can't put like what you saw before, it's stationary cameras and baited so baboons would come to them. But in the wild, how do you study behavior? Well, drones are our best, uh, really best, best option, but it's a really, really messy thing. And so, so they got a lot of data and labeled a lot of data. And the goal is not only to extract the behavioral traits, oof, really dark, to extract the behavioral traits, but really to understand how do they vary uh, what we call, let's say, vigilance, a head up. You'll see a head up behavior there. Uh, how do they vary across the population? How do they vary? So there is, you see, walking. There's a behavior on the bottom. Um, how do they vary uh, across species? Does vigilance in giraffe or walking, what we call walking in giraffe, look the same as walking in zebras? And what makes it the same? What is the trait that makes the behavior the same? So um, I'm gonna um, oh um, okay. We are come on. This is interesting. Let's do this for a second. Okay. We are going to go a little further out. All right. So there's still these giraffes and uh, you could see sort of the drone trying to figure out. Um, and then there is zebras. Now, so there's walking in zebras. Is it the same as? Uh, no, that's not going to work. Okay, we're going to then do this in this way. Um, there is walking in zebras. Is it the same as uh, giraffes? There is the uh, vigilance in zebras or head up. Head up is a really easy behavior. That's vigilance to recognize because it's so distinct. There we go. But the, you know, it's rare. You need to kind of scare them a little bit. Does the head up look the same in zebras as in giraffe? What makes it vigilance? And even more so, and it's going to go, I know it's going to go uh, in a minute too. And by the way, if you watch, all zebras do is grazing and grazing and grazing. And, you know, the students who watched for two straight weeks and had to write down, they had an app of like, tagging behavior of the observed animal, focal animal, uh, with a blazing sun and for three, four hours at a time, grazing, 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 walking. And then they were like, desiccating. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. So, so they were very excited. By the, one day they ran and came back and I was like super excited by defecation. Um, but the thing is, so here's what it all looks like. Not only that there is, you know, walking in a group. Walking in a group is actually different than walking individual animal. How do you recognize the social behavior? How do you recognize the, 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 this uh, little baby one kind of running up to catch, running to catch up with its mom? The, this little pushing away of the other species and look what's happening now. Right. This is this is very much a behavioral trait. This is group level behavior that is not extractable yet from these individual boxes. Right. And then they kind of okay, fine. <laughs> they went over there. Now we can cross the road again. And why are they even cross crossing the road? They're crossing the road because they're social animals. Because they need to get back to group cohesion. So all of this, you know, these are behavioral traits. For social animals, they're social behavioral traits. We're nowhere near being able to get like that richness yet from video. We'll get there. So one thing, of course, I've shown you examples. All of the examples I show are wild animals, right? And we're, but, but imagenomics is not limited to wild animals. There is the 
the lab animals that are wonderful for some aspects of behavior study. They've been, that's what they've been used in, used forever and ever. There's of course wild plants, which we haven't even talked about and extracting phenotype of wild plants. There's also non-wild plants. Agricultural, digital agriculture has been extracting phenotype from images for a while now and really focusing on it's like, is this a good tomato or is it a bad tomato? Is it diseases? It's not. Um, there is the, talking about diseases, there is this, not only the organism level, but cell level uh, extracting um, information from images and phenotype from images. Is it a cancer cell or not? A lot of it is just the association. They don't get to the because, right? Why is it a cancer cell? Why was it classified as cancer cell? We're starting to get there. And of course, there's also the, 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 the kind of the, the remote sensing, which is the continent level. And I hope that I gave you a taste. I've given you a taste of the richness of the questions and the possibility of the new approaches of really getting to look at more data more carefully and the type of questions that it can really get us to ask and the opportunity to answer. And so with that, you know, this is the team. Thank you to the team. Thank you all for listening uh, and to NSF for funding it and many others to coming together. Thank you. Do I need to enable something? Um, sorry, it's getting over there. There are several questions. Okay. Yeah, so let me bring this back. Ah, come on. Great questions. We're open. And you can take them. Okay, yes. Oh, there were people who, who yes. Yeah, we'll, we'll also take the chat questions. Yes. So, whichever one we're there. So, the group and... uh, I'll start with one chat and then, yeah. So, in the mimicry example, it looked like the butterfly acuity had strictly less information than the bird. How could they uh, have higher discrimination? So that what I was saying that uh, that it's not only it looks like blurred to us, but it's it's a different information assimilation um, the way they they, they the butterfly vision works versus the bird vision works, and and sometimes too much detail focuses your different parts of the uh, of the organism than 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 other. So. It is higher discrimination between self and mimic because they don't, because they, they, if you think about it as, as uh, things like triplet loss or arc loss, which is, you know, if you're showing it, if you, what is the goal? The goal is to, uh, to find the, those who are similar to you versus the goal is to find those who are different from you. These are two different tasks, right? So butterflies are really, really good at finding those who are similar to them versus not. And the birds, their goal is, you know, not to, uh, not to eat all the ones that look like this, right? To figure out who are the ones that look like this. So those are two different tasks. And the different acuity allows them to discriminate. It's not, it's discriminating for different things. Um, yes. Have you noticed whether or not the presence of the drone influences the animal? Yes, it does. It's a great question. Uh, we spent a lot of time, in fact, figuring out the right altitude angle and a pathway to approach to, to not get the only type of behavior, which is running. <laughs> <laughs> Because at the beginning, we got a lot of vigilance. And in fact, one of my PhD students, she, her whole work is on drones. So she really wants to focus on doing this intelligent, interactive drone mission planning that is getting the maximum information while not disturbing animals. And we've done it on different species, yes. Turns out that giraffes are the, most, the more skittish ones. <laughs> yeah, but like- for yeah, which taller. It's, it may not be that the thing because, you know, 
People were saying, oh, elephants are going to run because they're afraid of bees. Well, clearly, drones do not sound like bees to them. We could have landed that drone on an elephant. <laughs> we also could have landed it on a gravy zebra, but plain zebras ran. So it's, it, you know, at the beginning. So you really need to calibrate it. Yeah. Yes. Um, okay. Since we're talking about phenotype to phenotype, mm -hmm. and there is the term synonymous. Why is this not called image synonymous with an N between the E and the O? Because N from the genomics comes from gene. So N is not part no. of the omics. It's the term plus omics. So image omics. There is no N in the coming in. No, so this is no, there, this is there is no genotype coming in. Okay. This is primary commitment, yeah. Thank, oh, yeah, that's the quiz time. So, what do we call this field? Yeah. Yeah. Now I am. Thank you. Um, so the question from the, from the uh, chat many biologists have argued that we're in the midst of an anthropogenic mass extinction event, yes. Do you see your imagomics techniques as being particularly useful to document the decline of biodiversity across the globe? Uh, so conservation efforts are applied where they're most needed or at least where they have the best, they have the best chance at success. Absolutely, thank you for that question. Not only that, but we've used a lot of, so as I mentioned, we've done, we've taken some of these uh, tools um, and actually to put, a nonprofit with I co founded uh, and director of a nonprofit, while me, which develops AI for wildlife conservation tools. There's also collaboration. At, there's about, well, if I'm being generous, maybe 30 uh, people out there who develop these AI biodiversity monitoring tools and arguing that it is urgent. Not only uh, it's possible, but it is urgent actually and to, to address this challenge of biodiversity monitoring because not only we're in the middle of the sixth extinction, we actually don't know what we're losing and how fast. We, the, the UN said that biodiversity has a data problem. And to give you a taste of how shocking that data problem is that the International Unit for Conservation of Nature, Red List, the uh, IUCN Red List, the official body that monitors the biodiversity of the world. So when we say that the species are endangered, it's because the IUCN Red List for that species used a whole bunch of metrics to determine that their official status is endangered. So of the 160,000 or so species that they're monitoring, remember, out of 9 million, 20,000 plus, their official conservation status is data deficient. And this is not something obscure. These are killer whales. Their conservation status is data deficient. Of another 60,000 plus, their population trend is unknown. That status officially, if you go to ACN brothers, unknown. Again, not something obscure, polar bears. So if we don't know, even for these iconic conservation species, how many there are, where are they going, what's their range, does it change with the changing, you know, with the changing climate? How does it change? Is it going up, down, stable, who knows? So if we don't know even those basics, we really cannot put policies in place that protect the species and monitor whether these policies are working. So absolutely a resounding yes. Um, that was from the chat, <laughs> the question. Okay. Um, so please. So. No, the rest of them are, they thank you, very interesting talk. Thank you. <laughs> All right, any other any questions? Other questions? Yes. First, I'll get there. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I was I was wondering. Um, I think these days it's really easy to sort of throw machine learning at almost any problem. Uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. How do you kind of use your intuition, or how do you find research problems where you think machine learning can help, or how how do you kind of guide your research process so that machine learning can really show you something interesting and important by working with biologists a lot. This is and that's the fun part because if you ask and we did. Uh, and I do it every now and then, you know. So we ask both Dolly and Midjourney of, uh, uh, so you can ask it, uh, give me a, show me a image of museum collection of heliconius butterflies, right? 
Sure, no problem. We'll show you something that looks like museum collection. And for the most part, it's even the right species. Show me a museum collection of co mimic pairs of heliconius butterflies. Whoa, completely off, uh, completely uh, all, you know, all over the place. Not even one correct pair. It, it doesn't know basic biology. So you need to train it on the basic biology to, to, to get there. And then, uh, you know, the, the intuition in terms of what this is. So one answer, I spent my entire career to be a translator. So, so getting that intuition. But you don't need to spend 20 years in the field before you can ask good questions. You can be part of a team that can learn to talk to each other. And, you know, I start, I've been in many, many, many conversations, many rooms where biologists see computer scientists as bad data collectors, sorry, bad programmers, the other way around, bad programmers. And, and, and the conversation starts with a question of, can you write a program that does that or these days? Can you, can you give me a machine learning model that does that? And the answer is no. What's your question? And computer scientists see everybody, especially machine learning computer scientists, as pet data collectors. And the questions, conversation starts with the question, can I have your data? <laughs> and the answer is no. What's your question? It's really figuring out where the two questions meet in a good way. And it's not only biology in, in biology, right? It's it, in computer science, every interdisciplinary field, but in computer science, that happens, that conversation today, especially, has moved from like the very esoteric AI machine learning geeky, like, oh, we can answer this using machine learning to anything. And you really need to have this taste. They need to have the ability to figure out what's a good question and how do you pose it in, let's say, biological terms and in computational terms so that it becomes a good question. Act, so that the answer is a good answer. So you can, you know, look at these things more carefully. The other thing I would argue is we've seen ChatGPT and uh, Bard and others to provide answers to questions. They have incredible ability with full confidence to provide answers. Uh, not always correct, but there, there will be answers. I think it's fundamentally, still a human a human thing to ask good questions and i think it opened up the possibility for us to really ask good questions and think really hard what are the questions that we should be asking there was another yes yeah um, thank you for the talk. And uh, you, you mentioned something like the data is always sparse, and we cannot do basically do better on that. So you actually restrict the model, like uh, uh, with some not like the the one you mentioned is on from knowledge base. Mm -hmm. You actually use multimodal data to build this knowledge mm -hmm. base, but uh, and you mentioned it later is just like make the model more e explainable, uh, kind of more transparent so how can you do this because like a to my understanding is like a, what kind of techniques you are using to do mm. this because like a, if you do something like a on the knowledge base you do sparkle query or something like query on the knowledge graph and you definitely know well about the uh, how confidence you're uh, for for a certain mm -hmm. solution or answer but uh, in that case you probably don't have this prediction power but once you've got some generation stuff uh, or prediction stuff you you probably cannot tell for sure that which uh, which which is a source of your solution right so so it's a really good question so a couple of things that are going on there one is uh the data is not always sparse but it's always imperfect you sometimes can have full so it's almost always skewed distribution so you can have lots and lots of data for if you're talking about species level you're going to have tons of data for like five species like, and it's going to decrease the, the, the histogram of how many images per species. And then you're going to have, you know, for many, many, like five, one, two. Similar for if you're doing individual ID, you're going to have more than half, and we've done this now for many species, more than half of the animals are going to have one or two images. And that's it. So your problem is always going to be, so you're going to have this highly skewed, uh, distribution. A lot of them are uh, very sparse, so a big chunk of it is going to be very sparse, and it's going to be very noisy because we're also taking heterogeneous data. So we're taking data from 
digitized museum collections, from citizen science platforms, from social media, from, uh, you know, just um, the, the, the project, the research projects of somebody from camera traps, from drones, right? There's, there's all, all this data line and you can have some aspects that are better in one modality versus another. So, so this is this is the big thing. And then what you're aligning this data on is on the biological knowledge. So you can align it on anatomical ontology, as in this is wing, or like we're doing it with butterflies, they're doing image registration by placing the what they call the, the taxonomic landmarks. So there is defined spaces around the um you maybe there are defined spaces around the, the, the wing where these points correspond to biologically meaningful locations, the veins on the wing, and so on. And so you can have then these locations now that are where where you're going to to, to quantify the images. And then you can do knowledge, you can do uh, learning transfer. You can also uh, use the ontologies that say that the eye is part of the head and it's in front. Right, so so there is a lot of this relation data, so you can you can leverage that, and then um, the 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 thing is, do so you do fine grained learning quite often? And all of it is the the biggest thing of whether we acknowledge guided machine learning essentially, or the this the, the biological constructs, is to make sure and that's the holy grail that the embedding space, the Z space, right, actually aligns with the meaning with it with the semantics of biology we're trying to learn. So, so to my understanding, it's like a, this part, like a knowledge base is more like a survey for some feature engineering. But implicit feature engineering, we don't do explicit feature engineering. Okay. Right. What we're doing is, is we're constraining the embedding to drive it so it conforms to implicitly, we don't do it explicitly, conforms to the, bio, to the known biology. And then you say, okay, so now that it does, what else is there, right? So then you can ask the question, what else is there? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank Tanya again for the work. There's a question of meeting on five, so you can ask more questions about Tanya. And Tanya, thank you very much for, for the talk. Oh, <laughs> thank you for having me. And uh, thank you. Okay, there are more questions. Um, 